yeah so we're what, what we're really trying to fight for is for, for an individual to keep more of their own wealth so that they can make it the world a better place however they see fit and um, you know for a lot of our clients that's that's philanthropy uh, and we're happy to support that and for some it's you know taking care of kids or grandkids um, or again a lot of a lot of times they they do want to do good in the world so i i always tell them you know and, and sometimes i think some clients are a little bit um I don't know, they, they, they don't feel good about oh gosh i'm getting out of tax i've made so much money you know i should i should be paying in you know and and i get it's true to an extent but you know to me it's you know who knows who knows what to spend their money on better in the community is it is it the u.s government or state of california or is it you um and so if you want to go out there and make an impact and i, I give an example of you know autism research um, you know, I, have, I have another client who's really passionate about um, um, LGBT homelessness, um, and so they're 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 make going they're now they're going out there making really big differences. Um, and you know, for me, that's it's it's awesome. Love doing it. Heroes are an inspiring group of people. Every one of them, from the larger than life comic book heroes you see on the big silver screen, the everyday heroes that let us live the privileged lives we do. Every hero has a story to tell. From the doctor saving lives at your local hospital, the war veteran down the street who risked his life for our freedom, to the police officers and the firefighters who risk their safety to ensure ours. Every hero is special and every story worth telling. But there is one class of heroes that I think is often ignored. The entrepreneur, the creator, the producer. The ones who look at the problems in this world and think to themselves, you know what? I can fix that. I can help people. I can make a difference. Then they go out and do exactly that by creating a new product or introducing a new service. Some go on to change the world. Others make a world of difference to their customers. Welcome to The Hero Show. Join us as we pull back the masks on the world's finest heropreneurs and learn the secrets to their powers, their success, and their influence. So you can use those secrets to attract more sales, make more money, and experience more freedom in your business. I'm your host, Richard Matthews, and we are on in three, two, one. Hello and welcome back to The Hero Show. My name is Richard Matthews. Today I have live on the line Aaron Rubin. Aaron, are you there? I am here. Awesome. Glad to have you here. I know you're calling in from the San Francisco Bay Area. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually, I'm in San Francisco right now. Uh, so uh, I live uh, in uh, just south, but uh, but my office is here. That's awesome. My uh, um, family, I um, we travel full time. We're in Florida right now, but when we were in san francisco i had two of the craziest things i've ever seen in my life happen in san francisco one of shocking them, go ahead yeah yeah one of them was a uh um we got we got ninja a roll attacked by a lady who like looked like she was maybe 130 140 years old on um on a bike and we were getting ready to go on like a mass transit thing because that's what you do in san francisco is you get on the cool little trolley cars and we're waiting yeah. to get on one and this this lady who like i swear just so old she comes flying up to us on her bike and just like runs the bike into the curb right where we're at and ninja rolls off the front of it and then pops up in front of us and is like, you have the cutest baby in the whole world. <laughs> it's just, that was like, and I, I don't know how she was like standing up because she looked like my grandmother's <laughs> grandmother. Um, but there was well, that. Well, you know, I'll, t I'll tell you what, you know, you know, being in the city, I can just tell you this, meth's a heck of a drug. Uh, and, 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 and there may have been some substances involved. Yeah. Um, even for, even for those who are, who are in their hundreds, the, uh, the other one, which was even funnier, um, we were in downtown by that big pointy building. Um, and yeah, Transamerica, right? Yeah. That one, the uh, Transamerica building. And there's this little grassy patch where people would walk their dogs. And there was a gentleman there, um, who was dressed up like a dog. Um, walking in the grass patch, which is, that's not the crazy part. That's, I mean, you know, some people like to dress as dogs. He had his poodle holding a leash, standing on the sidewalk, walking him. Um, so he was being walked in the dog park by his dog. And I was like, that's something you only see in San Francisco right there. <laughs> you know, I, I am, I'm hoping there was a camera somewhere and that it was like one of the art students, you know, from, you know, the university art that was like trying to like do something. Cause that, that, that is the human <laughs> zoo uh, on display for sure. 
So yeah, yeah well, yeah. Welcome to San Francisco. I'm glad yeah. you had an authentic experience. <laughs> yeah, uh, it sounds like, the it, rest, like San Francisco. Other than those two things, was actually really awesome. We got to have like the uh, you guys are famous for the um, the sourdough bread and the clam chowder and like yeah. pure, was it Pier 39 where they have like the mall on the pier. Yeah, it was 39. all super cool. The kids loved it. We found like an ancient video game museum um, that they all got to go and play in. Yeah. So we had a great time. That's, you know what, we, we, you know, it's funny, my family, I just stumbled upon that one just uh, about a year or two ago. And we were like, where's, we, we had no idea. Um, did you, did you try the arm wrestling one? We did. We tried all of them. We spent like 60 Oh my bucks gosh. Oh my gosh. I injured, <laughs> I, I like injured my hand trying to do the arm wrestling one. Yeah. Like, it was my wife thought cool it'd be hilarious place. if I did like one. Yeah. 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 So anyways, I was like, San Francisco is absolutely worth visiting, but it comes with both fun and crazy is my point. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's, that's cool. It's, good. it's an awesome. accurate description. So what I want to do before we get too far into this is just a brief introduction of who you are, and then we'll just dive into your story. So um, you are um, an attorney, a CPA, and a certified financial planner. I um, mean, you run a wealth management practice, integrates tax financial planning and investing. You help your clients minimize their tax liability and keep more of their equity compensation so they can support the people they love and the causes they care about the most. So what I want you to start off with, Aaron, is why don't you tell me what it is you're known for, what you do, who you serve, what you do for them? Yeah, so we're we're known f- for our pre-IPO stock compensation planning. So for people who are at companies who are not yet public but are still issuing stock to their employees, um, there are lots of different choices to make. And it's confusing at times, and there are um, there are often issues with deadlines um, that people don't know about. And so, um, when people have questions about tax or strategy surrounding buying or selling their company stock um, that isn't readily <laughs> sold, uh, they come to us, and and that that's who we help. So, people who are you know usually you're, they're in their C or their D round. Um, of financing and um, they're usually, you know, uh, senior engineers, that sort of thing. Sometimes, you know, getting into the C-suite or founders, but again, everyone sort of needs a little help because it gets, it gets confusing quickly. Yeah. That's interesting. I have a a friend of mine um, actually who who just got, uh, I don't know what the word is in Silicon Valley. Um, Was it like sniped or something from one company to another with a, uh, with a giant IPO (laughs) stock package. Um, and he was just telling me they're getting ready sure. to IPO at the end of the year. So that might be like a good referral for you, right? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's perfect. Although I'll tell you what, I, I have not talked with anyone uh, and I have, I've talked with a, a different level, different numbers of, of C-level executives and everyone's saying 2023. So if you're, if, if your guys go in 2022, that's great. Yeah. Oh, um, I have no idea. So if you they just said, joined, then he. They just said it was like the end of the year or maybe yeah, next, you, early next year. So I'm not sure when it's happening. Yeah, the again, everyone's talking about 2023. But if you're, you know, if your friend just joined, right, he probably doesn't have any stock to sell because there's probably a lot, probably a lot of it's not vested yet. Yeah, um, but, I have no idea. You know, I have, I didn't get that far into point. the discussion with him. But he, he's, um, he's, you know, obviously with the, um, with, with the, uh, with the pre-IPO thing, when you go IPO, the usually there's six months um, before you can start selling your own stock, um, or sometimes they'll. They'll let you sell a little bit up front, but most of it, you got to wait anyway. So even if you just joined, if you joined six months ago, he may have some when the, that window opens up for him, he might have some, uh, some availability to, to get some liquidity. Absolutely. And that seems like a, it's a really specific niche to be in um, of pre-IPO stock planning. So I, what I want to find out is like, how did you get into that space for financial planning, right? I know, and on this this show, we talk about the uh, your origin story. Every good comic book hero has an origin story, how they uh, became the hero they are today. And we want to hear that story. Were you, you know, born a hero or were you bit by a radioactive spider that made you want to get into pre-IPO stock planning and wealth management? Um, or did you start <laughs> a job? How did you get here? Essentially, what was your story? Yeah, uh, bitten by a radioactive spider, uh, for sure. Uh, so, and, and, and with, with, although I'll, I'll, I'll admit something up front, the very first stock that I bought for myself was Marvel um, That's awesome. back in 1993. It was awesome until they went bankrupt. Uh, and then <laughs> I lost everything. So we t- talk about, you know, a good way to, to start an education. Um, so, so yeah, so my, I, I didn't get into this 
sort of on purpose. Uh, and, and I guess that's where the radioactive spider comes in. Um, I, uh, I went to law school and while I was in law school, I met, uh, met my wife and, um, and after we decided to get married, uh, her, her father said, you know, do you want to do what I do? And I was like, I, I don't know. And he's, he said, well, you know, I, I help people, you know, with their investments. And I thought, oh, I mean, I didn't know anything that, other, other than my Marvel experience. So, you know, in my mind, you know, you buy a stock and then it goes bankrupt. Somebody That's goes the bankrupt. Way it goes. But yeah, which, which apparently isn't the, isn't the plan. Um, but, um, but I said, sure, you know, that, that sounds really, sounds good to me. You know, a, a lot of, you know, the people that I knew who are in accounting, I mean, they were buried in tax season. They were, their hours were terrible. Um, they didn't see their family for months on end. And I thought that, that doesn't sound like it's for me. Uh, and same thing with my, with my lawyer friends, uh, my lawyer friends, you know, working crazy, getting paid nicely, but, but working crazy hours and not really seeing their families. And I thought that, that isn't for me. And so I had this opportunity and he said, well, that's great. Um, I can't take you on now. So why don't you um, spend some time in public accounting? I said, sure. And I, I, at that point I didn't have my CPA yet, but I had, I had a degree in accounting and um, I worked for three years and, uh, and then joined him in late 2009 or mid 2009. And it's been, it's been fantastic. Um, I, I've really enjoyed helping everyone working with like the smartest people in the world. Um, it's been, it's been great. Uh, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't trade for anything. So, so it's something you sort of almost fell into um, is, is helping people do their tax planning for pre-IPO stuff. And is the pre-IPO sort of niche just sort of because of where you're located, because you're in the tech Valley, that that's the people who are experiencing that sort of problem are just readily available. A lot of them are here. So, and, and, and there's a lot, there's a lot all over the place. Uh, a lot of people are moving out of California. Uh, some are going to Florida, uh, you know, where, where you are, we are right now. A lot of going to Texas uh, and anywhere else where the taxes aren't as horrendous as they are here. Yeah. You know, when we, you know, we, when we first started out or when I first started out, we were not that specific of a firm as time has gone on, you know, what, what happens happened. The reason why we got into this was because of zoom. Um, and, and this is pre COVID. Uh, so we, we got a, we got a referral from a, from an attorney whose, uh, client was at zoom and they needed some help on some of the tax and uh, financial issues. And so they came and they talked to us and we gave them some good information and they were like, Oh, that's, that's really helpful. And they, so all of a sudden we had four or five zoom people, um, you know, become clients. And, you know, before then we were sort of what, what I call a generalist where we would, we were looking at, you know, anybody who had a pulse and, you know, $500,000 or a million dollars, whatever it was, they could, they could feel free to join. Uh, and and we, we were kind of targeting everyone. And then, you know, we, we, we did, we went through this whole thing with zoom. And at that time we were actually considering closing down our tax practice um, because it's so labor intensive. Uh, and, um, after the whole zoom thing, you know, I sat down with, you know, my, the other partner, uh, who are working on these zoom clients with. And I said, you know, we do this like really well, like, like we're really good at this. You know, this is, this is what we should be doing. Like not, we should, we should forget about the other stuff. Yeah. We, we just, we, we, right. We discover superpower. And so from then on we said, all right, that's it. So when it, whenever we talk to people, we're going to talk about pre-IPO stock options and we're going to reorient our website to talk about pre-IPO stock options. And we're going to reorient our blog to talk about, pre I mean, th it, this is what we are going to be. And, um, and, and it's been, it's been awesome. I've, I've loved it. You know, I think, I think before when I was telling people what I did yeah, as that generalist, like what I found was I, w I wasn't compelling to myself. Like, I mean, I I'd sit there and I'd be, and as I was talking, I'm like, I'd be like, oh my, I'm so boring. This is terrible. Like, I mean, how how is anyone going to differentiate me from anybody else in this space? And and so I and so having found that that niche, right? It's it's it, I love talking about it, and 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 I get excited talking about it. And people think of me when when they hear some of the stock options. Yeah, and that's exactly what we want. So I mean, it's been that that's that's how we came into it. Um, so that's it's, sort of the whole long core story. It's really um, interesting because like the first thing that came popped into my head when you said what you did was like, I know people who are in that situation. That makes you easy to refer. 
<laughs> right. 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 If you're like, I just do tax planning or, you know, wealth management, like that's, it's, it's too general for me to, for, for just like people in my head that I know their stories for me to just fit you in somewhere. But when you're like, I do pre IPO stack um, stock planning. I'm like, I know someone who's doing that right now. So like I can refer them. <laughs> right. That makes, it makes you, right. uh, makes you like stand out in the crowd. Yeah. Well, when I talk to someone, I'd say, Hey, Oh yeah, my name is Aaron Rubin and I help people who are, I help retirees and pre-retirees and, uh, people who are coming into money from either divorce or, um, or inheritance, you know, plan for their wealth. Yeah. The, I mean, that didn't speak to anybody. So yeah, yeah no, it, it's, it's, it's been fantastic. So I'm going to talk then a little bit about your superpowers, right? So every iconic hero has a superpower, whether that's their fancy flying suit, um, you know, made by their genius intellect or their ability to call down thunder from the sky. Um, in the real world, heroes have what I call a zone of genius, which is either a skill or a set of skills that you were born with or you developed over the course of your career that really allow you to slay the villains in your client's life, so to speak, um, and come out on top in their own journeys. And your superpower, the way I like to frame it for my guests is probably a, um, there's a common thread in all the skills that you've developed over your career. And that common thread is sort of what sort of like ties everything together. And that's where you probably locate your superpower. So what do you think your superpower is in this business of wealth planning and tax management? Sure. I'd say it's understanding a system and manipulating it. Um, that that's it. It's what, and whether that's the tax system, right. And, and, the, and everything that goes behind that. And, and it's not just, oh, here's your tax bill. It's how, how, do we, how do we lower that tax bill? What are the different strategies that we can take that maybe we don't think about as tax necessarily, but that have tax effect that can, that can help us out? So for instance, right, you, you, know, you can say, well, I, you know, so I have a client who is, um, uh, who's, who is really into charities. And, and, he, and with, he, had a, he had a big payday from a from a, an IPO and he definitely wanted to give to charity well it's all about and it's about thinking about well okay with that goal in mind where can we pull from from estate planning from tax from from the investment side where can we do all these things and in, in, in where they all harmonize together and then and then bring them together to get the best effect for the client so in that case right the the clients well I I'm I'm really passionate about you know it was, it was autism research. And I said, okay, well, well, we could, you know, why don't we start a family foundation, you know, where you can control a lot of this asset. So, so sort of all, anything you put in the foundation, right. You still control. It's not like it's, you know, mm -hmm. being run by somebody else, you know, Oh, and by the way, you know, if, if we use the, if we use a charitable trust vehicle, you know, we could actually get a huge tax deduction on your income tax and save you a bunch of money there. Oh, and by the way, we can also, use that same vehicle to create tax losses to put on your tax return in the future. So you pay less tax in the future too. And so that superpower is saying, okay, you know, I, I know these different parts exist. How can we get them together to get the effect that we're looking for or to maximize the effect we're looking for? So I'm going to try and put this in super dumb math and hopefully it'll uh, make sense and you can correct me where I'm, where I'm wrong, but I want to make sure I'm understanding this, but like, so let's just assume you have a tax bill, easy math, $100,000 that you owe the government. And what you're talking about is being able to say, hey, instead of just paying the government $100,000, if we create a like a tax foundation or use some sort of charity thing um, and you take a portion of that money and put it into the foundation, that lowers your tax liability, right? So you, you, have, you have less tax liability um, and you're still, you're still not putting that hundred thousand dollars in your pocket, but at least portion of it is going to something that's a good cause and not necessarily going to the government. If that makes sense. Am I, am I understanding that correctly yeah. or am I close? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're close, but it, but it, but it's even better than that because what, what this client's, what's going to happen with this client is this trust is being run. Um, the, the money is going from the trust to his foundation where he gets to spend the money for the, the causes he really cares about. Now the trust as it's running, we we have, we have a, we have a portfolio in there. And it's generating capital losses inside of the portfolio. And because the way we because the way we structure the trust, those capital losses from the portfolio, which we're intentionally trying to grab, they're actually coming into his personal tax return. So not only is is that foundation getting its money, and it is, the 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 guy is also getting additional capital losses to offset future capital gains. 
And, <laughs> but wait, there's more. And um, when that trust is done paying out the the foundation over, it's a it's a ten year trust. Whatever is left over inside of the trust comes back to him. So it's sort of like he lent the cash to the foundation for like ten years, and what's ever left over after investing, he gets to take the money back. So it's it it's it's a super powerful way to go about giving money to charity. Yeah. So you get to give money to charity, and you get to um, realize losses that reduce your tax your tax burden every single year for the entire duration of the trust, and then whatever's left over, you get to take back. So it's like. It's like compound oh, and, money. And, right. <laughs> and and you and you got and you got a tax deduction when you put the money into the trust the first time. Yeah. <laughs> so like so you in your in your example, you know, you owe a hundred thousand dollars. You let's say and again, you, know, you wouldn't you would you would use this strategy for, for a lot bigger Larger sums, sums of money. Just easy math. hundred thousand is easy to hold your yeah, head. Yeah, I, yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and again, it's it I, I don't want anyone to be like, oh, I'm gonna get I'm gonna go get a charitable trust. You know, again, you, there's the, the legal costs would eat you up on this, right? So you, you, you'd want to make sure it's sizable. But it let, and let's say you put $10,000 into, you know, this charitable trust. You then turn around and put $10,000 deduction on your tax return. So you recognize $100,000 of income, less $10,000, you know, means you, you now have $90,000 of income for the IRS. Um, along the way, that $10,000 generates another $1,000 of capital losses, which you use on your tax return. The... And then at the end, after it's done paying out the, the charity, however much it's supposed to pay out, whatever's left over from that original ten thousand dollars comes back to you. I and mean, it's, so it's, 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 it's 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 a it's a crazy it's a crazy thing. That's awesome. Yeah, you get the benefits several times. But again, but but you have you have to think about things in terms of not just charitable and estate, but also income tax and investing. So once you once you once you get your mind around all those three things and how they all work together, you can create some really interesting situations. And that's why people call you because you know how that's to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I, I I leverage. You know, I'm an attorney, but I for sure leverage my relationships with other attorneys and. You know, I, I don't do the legal work because it's so it's so difficult uh, and it's and you get you got You got to have a team in place that knows what they're doing. Right. You, you have to you have to have your Justice League or your Avengers. Right. You can't you, you're, you're, you, uh, you're you can't you, people to make it happen. Yeah. You, you can't you can't go it alone. There's no way. So where where is the uh, the the dollar amount level of like tax burden that that starts becoming an interesting thing to, to entertain? Yeah. You know, I, I think. I think as a general rule, you know, if, if you're going to, if you have a million dollars that you want to put into, you know, a charitable trust that I think around a million is when it starts making sense. So um, that's, because, that's how much money is that was that your tax burden? If your tax burden is over no, 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 no. or the amount of money you want to put in is a no. million dollars. No, I mean, you sort of got to, if the money you're going to put into, the, so I would say you really want to be in the highest tax bracket, whatever it is. And so today, you know, the taxable income on the highest tax bracket, I think starts at five, 70 some. I mean, I have to go back and look at it, but you know, when, once you get over half a million dollars of, of adjusted gross income now using some of those charitable planning tools makes sense. And again, the bigger the number, the more it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're, I, I imagine the costs to run it don't change that much if the number goes up a lot because it's, you have your right, team already. Right. So that's absolutely correct. If it's a $5 million trust or a $10 million trust, right. The, the tax return is going to be about the same cost. The the prep of the documents is going to be about the same cost. You know, all it's you're right. That's exactly correct. Yeah. So so as you the amount of money that you're going to put into it goes up, it just gets more attractive. <laughs> right. Right. Because as a percentage of the of what you're using, it it, it goes down. Right. Um, so it's, that's really it, cool. It makes way more sense. Yeah, I I never even like consider any of those things. Like my goal is to get into that tax bracket at some point. Um, you know, in the next <laughs> sure. ten years or so, we're not there yet, but <laughs> it's useful to know. Um, so I want to talk about the uh, the flip side of your fatal flaw, right? So your superpower is one side. The flip sure. side of that coin is your um, is the fatal flaw. Just like every super um, Superman has his kryptonite, or Wonder Woman can't remove her bracelets of victory without going mad. Um, you probably have a flaw that's held you back in growing your business, something that uh, you struggled with. For me, it was perfectionism for a long time, sometimes still is, um, you know, keep, my, um, keep me from shipping product. Um, or the other one was a lack of self-care that I struggled with for a, you know, a good five years at the beginning of my career where I had, didn't have uh, 
good relationships with boundaries for my clients or good relationships with boundaries with time. So I would just work myself to death. I once tried not sleeping for three days. That's not a good idea, just in case you were wondering. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. But my, uh, the, the question essentially is like, but more, more important than like what the flaw is, is how did you work to, or how are you working to overcome it so that it doesn't hold you back and you can now um, continue to grow? Yeah. So, so for me, it's, I always have lots of ideas and I, and I'm always talking to clients about different things that, that we want to do. And, and my problem is I, I, I talk so much about them that I often like I lose track. Um, and so losing track of things and, and, and sort of I'll, uh, sort of letting, letting balls drop has, has been an issue with me. And the way that we've kind of gotten around that is one, I, I leverage technology as much as I can to remind me <laughs> of like, Hey, you know, blinking light, you know, you, you, you said this, you need to, you know, you need to, to, to perform on this. Um, or, you know, we just hired someone, um, at a new role for our company. Uh, and, and she's fantastic. And her job is to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks. So she's sort of on meetings with me. And when I say things to the client, <laughs> like, oh yeah, you know, this is what we should be doing. This is what we need to look at, you know, we'll have to get back to you on this. You know, she's the one that, you know, will email me, you know, two days ago for two days from then be like, Hey, did you ever deliver this? You know, was this, was this done? Um, and it's like, ah, okay, great. And whatever I can delegate to her, she'll do. And then whatever I need to do, you know, she's on top of me being like, no, you need to do this. So that's awesome. Yeah. I just so yeah, hired someone in a very similar role because um, we run a, a podcast production agency. Um, and the, um, the, uh, one of my problems with that agency is I was still doing a lot of the uh, customer communication um, back and forth between like my production team and the client. Um, and I would miss things because I'm busy trying to grow the company. And I was like, I was like, I need someone who's like, whose job is to be the customer advocate, so to yeah. speak that everything that the customer asks for or needs to do gets communicated clearly to the, the team and back and forth to the customers. Anyways, have that person in place now. It's really wonderful. So it's, you know, we got, you got to, uh, I always tell people, or at least myself um, is you got to either hire or have tools that shore up your weaknesses, right? Not necessarily that you have to fix them, but yeah. you have to have oh, some absolutely. way to mitigate them. Yeah. And, um, you know, whenever I meet with a cl new client or client with, with her on there, you know, it's like, Hey, I just wanted to you know this is, this is our person. She's there to make sure that you have a good experience. And, and no one's ever been like, you know, Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Everyone wants a better experience. Yep. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's been great. Yeah. I, we, I uh, um, I've taken to calling her, um, in our position, the, uh, customer advocacy or customer advocate. I was like, she's your advocate for in the company that like, she's on, like, not that we're on That's different great. sides, but like, That's the, great. Her job is to just make sure you have a great experience. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a that's a cool hire. Yeah, maybe, maybe she needs to be, a, yeah, an, an ombudsman, um, or uh, they, they sort of represent you know the, the people. So I don't know. I, I always I was was fascinated with the word. So there we go. Yeah, that's awesome. So I want to talk then a little bit about your common enemy. Right. And every superhero has an arch nemesis. Right. And it's the thing that they constantly have to fight against in their world. And in the world of business, I like to put in the context of your clients. And it's a mindset or a flaw that your clients come to you with that if you had a magic wand and you could just bop them on the head as soon as they signed on the dotted line and not have to deal with that. Um, what is the um, arch nemesis or the common enemy, so to speak, that um, you have to fight to overcome with all of your clients as they come in? Yeah. So, so I, I, I like to think it's the IRS, um, you know, <laughs> truthfully, you know, I, I think oftentimes I think we demonize the IRS more, more than, more than we should. Cause honestly, I mean, the IRS doesn't pass the laws. They actually, you know, they, they write the, you know, they do enforce them and they, they do write, you know, regulations under the department of treasury. I'm mean, really, to me, Congress is the enemy, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, to mobilize against Congress. Um, uh, the IRS people understand. So I, I mean, for, for me, you know, it's a lot of, it's the complexity surrounding, um, surrounding the tax code. Um, now, of course it wasn't, if it was, if it wasn't as complex then I would be out of a job. Um, but, um, but, but to me that, that we'll say the common enemy is, is the IRS or maybe the department of treasury. Maybe I'll feel better about the department of treasury. <laughs> it's interesting too, because like, I like our, our tax system, I think that would, the support system that exists to help people prov 
do their taxes is something like a $4.6 billion a year industry or something last time I looked at it, which is massive. Um, and it just speaks to the complexity of our tax code. And I've, I've always been one of those like the, on the uh, political side of the scale, I, there's got to be a simpler way to run taxes than what we have because it is really complicated um, and doesn't seem to have a lot to do with how much someone actually consumes in the economy and the structures that we're using um, and has a lot, it, it seems very arbitrary and I feel like it could be a lot simpler, but I don't know how to fix that. So that's not a discussion I have a lot. I just think it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know a lot about comparative tax systems, but you know, I, again, I do know that there's pretty heavy taxation. Um, if you look at, you know, countries like Europe and, and, you know, the VAT, which is, you know, again, more of a, um, I think more of a consumption type of tax. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about the flip side then, right? So if you're a common enemy or the arch nemesis is the RS and the tax code, the driving force is what you fight for, right? So just like Spider-Man fights to save New York or Batman fights to save Gotham or, you know, Google fights to index and categorize all the world's information. What is it that you fight for with your tax practice and your wealth, um, your wealth management system, um, services? Yeah. So we're, what, what we're really trying to fight for is for, for an individual to, keep more of their own wealth so that they can make it the world a better place, however they see fit. And, um, you know, for a lot of our clients, that's, that's philanthropy. Uh, and we're happy to support that. And for some it's, you know, taking care of kids or grandkids, um, or again, a lot of, a lot of times they, they do want to do good in the world. So I, I always tell them, you know, and, and sometimes I think some clients are a little bit, um, I don't know, they, they, they don't feel good about, oh gosh, I'm getting out of tax. I've made so much money. You know, I should, I should be paying in, you know, and, and I get, it's true to an extent, but you know, to me it's, you know, who knows, who knows what to spend their money on better in the community? Is it, is it the U S government or state of California or is it you? Um, and so if you want to go out there and make an impact and I, I gave an example of, you know, autism research, um, you know, I have, I have another client who's really passionate about um, um, LGBT homelessness, um, and so they're 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 make going they're now they're going out there making really big differences. Um, and you know, for me, that's it's it's awesome. Love doing it. Yeah. So I have I have a uh, framework you might be able to share with clients on that, and I call it uh, first party spending, second party spending, and third party spending. And so first party spending is right. when you take, when you have money that you're going to spend on something for yourself. And when you do that, you care about both the price and the value. Um, second party spending is when you're going to spend, um, uh, spend your money on something for someone else. And that means you care about the price, but you don't necessarily care about the value as much because it's not something that you're mm -hmm. going to use. And third party spending is when you're going to spend someone else's money on something that's not for you. So you don't care about the price or the value and all government spending yeah. by definition is third party spending. So they don't care about price or value. So they will never put the same care and thought into spending that money as you will, um, in, sure. in, you know, in deploying it. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's great. That's, that's absolutely true too. Yeah. <laughs> that's, it's one of those things that's like, cause I've, I've had that discussion a few times with people like, well, you know, if you earn more, more income, why would you want to reduce your tax burden? And I'm like, because the, the government is just always going to be third party spending it because it just has to be by definition. And just human nature says that it's not ever going to be spent as well or as efficiently as someone who's deploying it themselves for things that they care about. So it's, yeah, it's no, just a better I mean, use of resources. Yep. No, I totally agree. That's great. It's yeah. great. Great way to think about it. So I'm going to talk about the some, some practical things. I call this the hero's tool belt. Um, and just like every superhero has a tool tool belt with awesome gad, awesome gadgets like their battering or they, uh, their super hammer they can spin around and fly with. I want, to talk, I want to talk about the top one or two tools that you use every day in your business. Could be anything from your notepad um, to your calendar to something you use for your marketing tools um, or something you use to actually do your service delivery. Um, something you think is essential to getting your job done on a daily basis. So, I mean, email is like my, my big thing. Um, and, and so I, I, so I, I'm one of those people that use their emails as also their to-do list. So I, again, we, I talk about leverage technology to make sure things don't fall off my plate. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I, I definitely use email 
like that. So my, my, my inbox is like my, is what I live by. Um, we're also, you know, we're, we're right now we're making really big enhancements to our, um, CRM or our, cl- our client relationship manager. So we're, we've, we've been adopted Salesforce, which is, you know, this huge, vast pit, um, for which you can spend endless amounts of time. That is um, but, but, um, <laughs> But we're we're spending a lot of time. We and we we're getting help on it too, and um, that is going to be huge for us because that's this is where we're going to keep our notes. This is where you know we're going to be able to have business continuity, uh, and and I'm super super excited about it and tracking projects and um, it's it's going to be amazing. But we're we're yeah, just yeah. we're just starting to use it. We're just starting to leverage it the right way, and uh, and it's going to be so good. So we so just good. did. Uh something very similar. Um, we're, we're using ClickUp in the same same way. ClickUp is a similar type system. And so we're using it as a CRM and a project management and process documentation. And we're um, moving it from where we had it all sort of in like disparate systems all into like this one. We went from being like all of our delivery was, you know, like just on time kind of thing to like we're a week or two weeks ahead on everything and everything's getting documented well and we can keep track of everything. And there's a lot of continuity. And um, my only point in saying that is just that like, it's a wonderful thing to finally get a system, whatever it is, whether it's ClickUp or, you know, Salesforce in place to sort of track everything that's going on. It had a huge impact on my business. I hope it has the same for yours as you get it implemented. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I was, you know, I was just at Saster last week, um, which is a, a trade thing for um, software as a service companies. ClickUp was there uh, and very popular. So yeah. you are not alone in your, in your ClickUp, uh, <laughs> ClickUp party. They are, uh, and it's an impressive piece of software, um, and uh, they're they're doing good work with it. So, you know, um, using it as a CRM is a bit of a stretch for like their use case, um, but it does work well. Um, and I, they're they're making some changes to it, I think, in their whatever their next version is that's coming out. That's they're going to take their, I guess, the the baseline of their database and change a little bit of its structure so that they're not all it's not all task focused, and you can have them be you know mm. represent people instead of representing a task or represent a company instead of representing a task. But right now we're just like, I'm, I've modified their, <laughs> their structure to use a task to work as a CRM. Um, but anyways, it's like a lot of people are doing that. So they were like, Hey, maybe we'll just make that part of the core. Right. Right. When your customers are telling you something, maybe, you, <laughs> you know, you start <laughs> to listen, I guess. Absolutely. And now a quick word from our show's sponsor. Hey there, fellow podcaster. Having a weekly audio and video show on all the major online networks that builds your brand, creates fame, and drives sales for your business doesn't have to be hard. I know it feels that way because you've tried managing your show internally and realize how resource intensive it can be. You felt the pain of pouring eight to 10 hours of work into just getting one hour of content published and promoted all over the place. You see the drain on your resources, but you do it anyways because you know how powerful it is. Heck, you've probably even tried some of those automated solutions and ended up with stuff that makes your brand look cheesy and cheap. That's not helping grow your business. Don't give up though. The struggle ends now. Introducing Push Button Podcasts, a done for you service that will help you get your show out every single week without you lifting a finger after you've pushed that stop record button. We handle everything else, uploading, editing, transcribing, writing, research, graphics, publication, and promotion, all done by real humans who know, understand, and care about your brand almost as much as you do. Empowered by our own proprietary technology, our team will let you get back to doing what you love while we handle the rest. Check us out at pushbuttonpodcast.com forward slash hero for 10% off the lifetime of your service with us and see the power of having an audio and video podcast growing and driving micro celebrity status and business in your niche without you having to lift more than a finger to push that stop record button. Again, that's pushbuttonpodcast.com forward slash hero. See you there. And now back to the hero show. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about your own personal heroes, right? Every hero has their mentors, just like Frodo had Gandalf or Luke had a Wee Kenobi or Robert Kiyosaki had his rich dad or even Spider-Man had his uncle Ben. Unless you're watching the newest movies, it's his Aunt May. Um, who were some of your heroes? Were they real life mentors, you know, peers a couple years ahead of you or maybe authors or speakers? Um, and how important were they to what you have accomplished so far in growing your practice? Yeah. You know, I'd say, you know, my, my ment I've had great mentors to be honest with you. Um, you know, some, some going, going back to my, when I was in, in college, but, you know, I'd say, you know, my, my father-in-law has been a huge mentor, um, you know, for me, uh, you know, he's, he's been in the industry for, 
40 plus years um, and, you know, said, okay, you know, st you're going to starting in 2009 when I joined in, uh, he said, okay, now you're, you're going to be sitting in, uh, in my meetings for the next couple of years. So, and, and that's what we did, <laughs> you know, and I, um, you know, learned, learned a lot from him. Uh, and, um, you know, he, he introduced me to the whole thing. So he, he wrote a book, um, a long time ago, uh, that ended up getting several new editions with new authors on it, uh, called, um, the prudent investors guide to investing and gave me that book when I was, uh, my third year of law school. And I, one weekend I read through the whole thing and it, it was, it was like eye opening and amazing. So it was sort of that this, Whoa, this, this is, this is how it actually works. And it was, it was, it was crazy. It, it completely blew my mind <laughs> as, as someone, as someone who's, as someone who's only experienced previous that had been bankrupt Marvel stock. <laughs> You know, I was like, oh, okay, that's how that works. Okay. You're like, oh, I get it now. Uh, uh, that's awesome. Um, and, you know, I've always, I've always been a, a big fan of just sort of understanding the people that are, have an influence on how you do what you do, because, I, you know, every hero has their mentors. And it always reminds me to think this, like, those people don't always even know that you would think of them as a mentor. So it always, it's like, there's probably people out there who look at me and think of me as their hero. And I always think to myself, am I acting in a way that's you know, uh, worthy of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you when I, when I, I, so I wrote a book uh, a couple of years back, um, called financial adulting I and, like uh, book. and I for sure, uh, yeah, I, I for sure put Yeah. You know, it was so good that some, some actual author stole my title just last year, uh, and, and use financial adulting. They, I guess they re they wrote their own book on it and, but they actually had like a real publisher. So, um, you know, I was just self-publishing. Um, but in, in, in my version of the book, <laughs> the true version, as I like to call it, um, it, uh, I definitely, you know, thank, thanked him and acknowledgement and, um, you know, all that good stuff. So he knows he should know, he should know. So I want to talk to you about some of your guiding principles, right? One of the things that makes heroes heroic is that they live by a code. For instance, Batman never kills his enemies. He only ever puts them in Arkham Asylum. So as we wrap up the interview, I want to talk about the top one or maybe two principles that you live your life by, run your business by, maybe something you wish you knew when you first started out in this uh, in this business. Oh, okay. Um, so I'll, I'll say two. Um, the, fir the first is you you have to be honest at all times, at all times. And because if, if you try to start making stuff up, you're going to get – you're, you're going to destroy your reputation, right? It's that old adage, you know, reputation takes a lifetime to build and a minute to destroy. So you, you really have to be careful, you know, make sure that you are really telling the absolute truth on everything. Um, so that, that, that's a must. Um, I would say the other, the other thing that I had, I had kind of learned, it took me a while to get to was you have to be yourself at all times as well. Um, and so when I first started doing the, this advisory thing after spending three years in public accounting, you know, for the first several years, I spent much of my time trying to be what I thought was the right advisor instead of being myself. Um, and so, you know, it was, I, I, I spun my wheels a lot, you know, trying to be something that I wasn't. Um, and then eventually I was like, wait a second. I just, I, it, you being yourself means, you know, that, you know, there's going to be people who aren't going to like you <laughs> and they aren't going to work with you because of that. Um, but, you know, but people can sense authenticity um, and people would much rather be someone who's authentic than not. Yeah. Yeah. And the people who aren't going to like you weren't going to like you anyways. And they weren't your client. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there so. you go. But, I, but I, I, but I think, I think when we're younger in our careers, I think we're always trying to, to play the part. And then at some point we get, we get to, Oh, Hey, I just gotta be myself. Yeah. And, yeah. and so when and I got, when I got, when I got easier. there, it much like better. it's easier to be yourself. You don't have to try. You just yeah. be you. <laughs> so that's yeah. True. yeah. 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 Um, and I know with I, I the, agree. the honesty thing, one of the things that has struck me is like that we're on episode like two thirty or some, some number like that with this show. Um, and I would say probably roughly 80, 80 plus percent of the people I ask that question to have some form of, of answer that comes back to honesty or integrity, um, which always has struck me as really interesting because culturally we have this view that entrepreneurs are villains 
Um, and it's actually why we run this show is because I, I'm of the very staunch opinion that entrepreneurs are the heroes. Um, and they're the ones that are changing the world to make it better. And it's just interesting to me how how common of a thing that entrepreneurs like, they're very actively thinking to themselves and running their business by a foundational principle of integrity and honesty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I think we've all had the, uh, the experience where we weren't dealing with someone like that. And, and that isn't the experience we want to give anybody else. And I mean, unless we're really jerks. (laughs) (laughs) So I have, I have a theory. Um, a friend of mine, I've been, I've been talking about this, about why it's so pervasive culturally to think of entrepreneurs as villains, because villains, like you can't turn on a kid's TV show without the bad guy being some version of entrepreneur spills money, oil on money for, or on ducks for money, right? <laughs> um, and yeah. and I, I think the reason why that is the case is because it is, um, it's, not, it's not normal and normal doesn't make good storytelling, right? Things on, on opposite ends mm. of the spectrum makes for good storytelling. And because it makes good storytelling to have an evil entrepreneur or a really good entrepreneur one way or the other, um, you have to have the extremes for the good storytelling that, um, you know, storytelling in movies and TV shows and books and everything makes it sort of be this like cultural perception that entrepreneurs are the bad guy. And that's really just not the case. So that's my theory. I don't know if it's true or not, but that's <laughs> that's my theory on why that happens. Yeah, I, 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 th- I, think, that, I think that's viable. You know, I, I think also that, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to be an entrepreneur, right? It's, it's hard to wake up with that mission every morning and, you know, you, you just, you, you can't let anything go. And, you know, it's, and and I think for, for people who don't necessarily have that mentality, you know, they, and they see a very successful entrepreneur. I think part of it is when you see someone who's super successful, you have to ask everyone has to ask themselves why aren't i as successful as they are and mm-hmm. and 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 i and i do this right i mean like i'm not as successful as jeff bezos is i i don't think i'll ever will be um yeah. you know and but you know and i and i think if you are an entrepreneur you understand you know that people like jeff bezos like he did, man he risked everything i mean he and i mean he had a mission and he wouldn't stop i mean like he i mean i i don't i mean I don't think his personal relationships are, are, are anything to write home about. Um, I mean, his, he, there are documented things about him. Um, but you know, but people like that are just, you know, they're a different breed. And, and yeah. I think it's, it's, it's a shortcut. I think for people who, who aren't as entrepreneurial to be like, well, they must be doing something wrong or, or they're, they're, they're bad or they're, I mean, they, you know, they, they, it's ill begotten, um, mm-hmm. in some sense. Um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, for me, I'm just like, I, like, I, I'm not willing to do the things that Jeff Bezos was willing to do. Yeah. Right. That, I mean, and, and I'm probably, and I'm not as smart as Jeff Bezos, but that's okay. You know, and, but you know, he's, he's going to do his thing and I'm going to do mine. Yeah. But and, uh, and I, I think if I did, bring, if I didn't uh, have that perspective. Value. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, and I, and I'm, I, I, I love the life I've created and, and I'm fine with it. Absolutely. And I think that is a great place to wrap our interview too. So I do finish every interview with a simple challenge. I call it the hero's challenge. And I do this to get access to stories I might not otherwise find on my own because not everyone is out doing the podcast rounds like you and I might do. Um, So the question is simple. Do you have someone in your life or in your network who you think has a cool entrepreneurial story? Who are they? First names are fine. And why do you think they should come share their story with us here on the hero show? The first person that comes to mind for you. First person that comes to mind with me is so so his name is bryce emo uh he's uh he just founded a company uh, a few months ago called sidecar finance and he what he does is he helps people who are at pre-ipo companies um find the right partners with to sell or otherwise liquidity get liquidity for their shares their their private shares um and so he started at a, at with a lender, um, you know, several years ago, and you know helped them raise tons of money. It was super successful, and now he's out there, sort of on the opposite side of the transaction, helping helping people at 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 the companies negotiate against sort of his former employer and 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 the employer as a group as well. So he's sort of he. I, and and I, and and again, I, I don't want to demonize you know the the lenders right because they're they're super important, um, 
but he's sort of now on the side of the little guy who's now negotiating against the lender. So he's, he's sort of, he's, he's flipped his side, which I thought was super cool. Um, and he's got a really awesome business model. I mean, he's, and he's, he's, a, he's great. And, he, and he's, he's so smart. He's awesome. <laughs> That's cool. Total, well, total we'll... man crush, total man <laughs> crush right here. <laughs> we'll see if we can reach out afterwards and maybe get an introduction to him, get him on the show. They don't always say yes, but sometimes when they do, we get a uh, cool interviews and get to hear the, uh, the, how some different businesses are founded. So I appreciate that. Um, but in comic books, there's always the crowd of people at the end who are cheering and clapping for the acts of heroism. So our analogous to that on this show is um, where can people find you if they need your help in the future? Where can they light up the bat signal, so to speak, and say, hey, Aaron, um, we'd like to get your help with our pre-IPO stock. And I think more importantly, or who are the right types of people to reach out and actually light up the bat signal and ask for your help? Yeah, so we are we are everywhere. So um, we're at Twitter, uh, WRP Advisory. We're at We're on Facebook. WRP Wealth. Um, we are on TikTok. TikTok, I tell you. Um, uh, IPO Graphs is our, is our handle at TikTok. Uh, and of course, LinkedIn uh, there as well. Our blog is phenomenal. Uh, if you want to know, if you have any questions about information on A3B elections, or if you don't know what A3B election is and you want to know, uh, that's, that's where you head. Uh, our blogs have are chock full of great information. Uh, and, um, and if you wanted to, you could schedule an appointment with me, uh, on, on our website, uh, as well. Uh, so, you know, in, in terms of, you know, people who, who come see me, usually it's people, those who are in their D round of financing, <clears throat> maybe again, maybe even beyond sometimes the C round makes sense. But again, what, especially if, if you're moving jobs, you, you know, you, you're coming to a new space and you have choices with your stock options good a good idea to talk to someone even if even if from a wealth perspective it doesn't work out our tax team can almost always help you too so um again we, we have a, a pretty great offering awesome well i do appreciate you coming on and sharing your story with us today aaron it has been fascinating i've learned quite a bit hopefully our audience did as well do you have any uh, final words of wisdom for my audience for this uh, stop record button uh yes yes i have to have something um yeah, no but my final words of wisdom are um seek tax help um, don't try to go it alone um, because it's complicated and you don't want to mess it up. And there's some choices you can make early on that could really affect, you know, how much you get to keep later down the line. So go to get tech. Once you, once you get some stock options, you know, more than let's say 20, 25,000 shares of whatever, you know, go to go see a tax professional. It's, it's worth your while. Awesome. Thank you very much, Aaron. I appreciate it.